folks, I'm Yolanda Johnson Bryant, and you're watching The Other Side of the Dash. Hey folks, welcome back to my channel. If you have not already done so, please hit that subscribe button below. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And we love to see your comments because we love to interact with our audience. So today's guest on Other Side of the Dash is going to be Sherelle Gordon-Love. Now Sherelle is an author, a publisher, a motivational speaker, and a brand ambassador. So I'm gonna go ahead and let her speak and tell you a little bit more about her. Welcome to the show, Sherelle. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. As you already shared, I'm an author. I'm a publisher. Um, I added screenwriter this year to that. Oh. Brand ambassador. Yes. I'm a mom of three grown sons. Um, and my youngest son and my daughter-in-law, they um, made me a grandmother for the first time. Congratulations. I have, thank you. <laughs> I have almost 15 month old identical twin granddaughters. Wow. And they are the highlight of my week. I say that I, 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 when I wow. see them, they are literally the highlight of my week. Um, outside of that, right now I'm, I am my mom's caretaker. So that's another hat that I wear. Um, outside of that, that's that's it. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to talk about that caretaking for, for your mother-in-law, but I just want to say, I am currently raising my granddaughter. She will be 11 on Sunday, and it is a joy. The only thing about it is now I'm realizing is you spoil your grandkids, you love them to death, and you send them back home to their parents. Unfortunately, mine lives with me, so I can't send her back home. So <laughs> what happens is I have spoiled her and I have somewhat created a monster that I'm trying to roll back. So oh. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so let's first begin. Let's go back a little while, Sherelle, and talk about um, you were a victim of domestic violence. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You don't have to go into deep detail if you don't want to, um, but just tell us about it a little bit and how you were able to uh, remove yourself from that situation. Uh, back then um, with domestic violence and being part of the church, it, it, was, it was just swept under the rug. I was told that whatever he did, I had to accept, I had to deal with it and I couldn't leave, that it was a sin to divorce, that you know, divorce was a sin. And, and in my mind, I kept saying, um, I can't believe that the God that I serve would want me to stay in a violent situation where I could, lo could lose my life. Um, and so instead of talking to other people or another mother in the church and stuff like that, what I ended up doing was I um, separated myself and just started fasting and praying. And little by little, God led me how to get out. <laughs> Excuse me. One of the things that um, he showed me, it was a whole year before, he showed me in a dream that everything that would happen was going to get worse each time and that the last time would be violent, but he would deliver me out. Mm. And I had, you know, by the time my three sons were here and I kept saying, I don't want my, my, my boys to grow up thinking this is normal. This is how you have a relationship. And even back then, I, I wasn't even sure about um, the domestic violence, the, the batter shelters and stuff like that. I wasn't, you know, it's not like on TV, you see it today, but um, just like the dream happened, that's exactly what happened in my life. Right. Um, I had to hold on to God and believe that he would make a way out for me. Um, I was afraid to leave because believe it or not, 
when you're leaving, that's the most dangerous, the, the most dangerous time in that type of relationship because they don't want you to go. Right. But it so happened the morning that he became very violent. It was like the worst ever because whenever I would be hit, nobody knew it because it was under my clothes. So, you know, they, you know, but that day he went for broke. Wow. My face was bruised. Um, and it's, and, and I, when I share this, um, I still get, <laughs> I still feel I'm that. Sorry. And, um, but it, it's okay. It's, but that morning, I remember that morning so clearly in the midst of um, the violent act, I just started, I was praying because I couldn't beat him. And as I was praying, I, um, I could feel God's presence cover me. And while he's hitting, I started praising God because I could feel his presence. And when I heard myself, I didn't know I was praising him out loud. Right. So did he, he heard it as well. And when he heard it, it was like he snapped to himself. And he said to me, you see what you made me do? I said, it's fine. So I was praying as I was going, I had to go to work. Um, the two older ones, they were in school. My baby wasn't, he was going to the babysitter. And what I understood that morning and knew I had to make that day as normal as possible. I couldn't do anything different. So I, I, um, you know, gathered them, my, my baby, I couldn't take him because, um, that was the routine. He dropped him off. And so, um, um, we getting ready to leave and, and he had the extra key to my car. I said, I got to get my key because if I, if I don't, he's going to steal my car. And so I went to get the key and he always carried a whole bunch of keys that made a lot of noise. I went over to that key ring and I'm just praying that that key slid off that ring without a sound. <laughs> no sound I got the other two and we hurried up and um I went to my grandmother's house my grandmother helped the raise me so I went I went I went home and as soon as I walked in the door she was standing at the top of the stairs and she looked at me and she said what happened it was like she knew she knew something I said I just need to come home grandma she said well you come on home she she knew she knew right. something happened. Right. She said, you come on home. And um, from there, you know, we went back and forth for a while, for a while, you know, um, him trying to get me back, trying, following me around, stalking. Oh, <laughs> she's talking to this person. No, that was you doing all of that. And um, we never got back together ever. That, that, no, we never got back together. But God is something mm -hmm. because <laughs> my sons ended up growing up through teenage years, through high school, and they really didn't have a relationship with him. And so um, but at that time we had left, we had moved away from my home state and like we lived in Connecticut for like 11 years. So then when we finally moved back, I moved, ended up moving back home and that was segue into the, the cancer thing. Um, they did their best, especially my middle son. He wanted a relationship. So um, they really didn't know how to talk to him either. So whenever he would say, I want to take you out of lunch, I want to do this with y'all, they would invite me to come. Right. And I would say, no, I say, yeah, that's, that's your, your no, y'all go do that. But they would really press me. So I started going and we ended up hanging out, but it was unbeknownst to me at first, it was a way for them to connect and gain a relationship because I knew how to talk to him and I knew how to talk to my sons. Right. So they learned to communicate and learned how to get to know each other with me in the middle. And we turned around some years, even after that, we ended up being friends. And I would just believe that if we were that, if we were friends in that manner, in that way, and respectful of each other, the way we were, we wouldn't have never, you know, broke up. We would have been together. And then um, a couple of years ago, he, he did pass away. 
had oh. gotten ill. And who was there? You were. I was mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you talk about a 180. <laughs> oh, total 180. That shows that God can change anything or anybody. But in this case, sometimes it may be a little bit too late, but he can do it. Yes. So yes. I want to segue. We're going to segue to the cancer, but I want to ask you first. Now, I know you had to take care of your ailing father. Was this before or after you you contracted, not contracted, I don't know what the word is, you got cancer? It was before. Um, okay. So how was that was taking before. care of your father? Now, was this before the abusive situation or after the father? So it, it was after. Okay. So after you're coming out of an abusive relationship, trying to be a single mom, raising your kids, your father falls ill and you are responsible for taking care of him, correct? To a degree, because I, I still lived in Connecticut. He lived in New Jersey. So my role was when I would come down on the weekends and whatever he needed for me to do and things like that. And, um, you know, he, in the beginning, we didn't think he was going to pass away. He um, had lung cancer. Okay. Um, and we did not think that he was, you know, because they would say he was in remission and he was doing really well. And then when it came back, it was, it was quick. It was really okay. quick. Okay. So I was there almost up to the end with him um, with okay. that. And it was it was rough because I'm the oldest girl. So everything now I do have an older brother, but I'm second and I'm a okay, girl. Gotcha. So you know how that fall in family. Right. You're the oldest girl. So much responsibility falls to you. And um, so I was trying to be strong for everybody else and um, you know, watch my father deteriorate. It was, it was really difficult because of our relationship. I was really, you know, very close to my dad. And throughout that, he started preparing me. And like two weeks before he passed away, he let me know. He okay. let me know, he, you know, I want all of you to get along. He said, because it's almost time for me to go. I mean, he said it like, eh, this is regular oh, So he knew, he knew. Yes. Yes. So let's say, okay, so let's, let's, okay. So you are coming out of this abusive relationship, um, dealing with your father and then him eventually passing away. That had to be very stressful. Um, it was some years in between. Um, oh gosh, for me, for the, the domestic violence was, um, let me see, 89, 88, 89 back then. My father got sick in 2002. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. Yeah, so it's, it was a big gap. Um, okay. Yeah, and he passed in two, 2004. So let's fast forward here, okay? So when did you uh, find out that you had cancer? And tell us the type that you had. I found out in December, December 19, 2007 that I had um, carcinoid cancer. And it's a um, cancer that develops in the digestive tract, anywhere in the digest digestive tract. Um, the, that morning I was, I got up that morning and I felt like I had indigestion because I had eaten, I don't know how many oranges the night before. <laughs> big old Florida oranges. And I was like, oh my gosh, I said, I'm not going to do that again. So I'm riding to work, listening to my music, praying, everything, you know, that I do in the morning. Got to work, turn my computer on. And I just started feeling really, really sick. And I couldn't even hold my head up. Um, I have a, had a coworker who she was like our um, uh, medic for our, for our department. Mm -hmm. And as soon as she walked in, she was just like, uh-uh. She was telling everybody to get back away from me wow. because I mean, I had gotten clammy. I was running a fever, um, but I was the pain in the top of my stomach. I tell everybody I would have all three of my sons all over again and two were C-sections. If anybody said there's no worse pain than labor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh yes. <laughs> so um, I ended up being rushed to the, to the um, ER and after the CAT scan, they still didn't know what it was. They just told me um, what they had to do. And I um, 
I'm laying there. They had to give me morphine. That's how bad it was. And so I'm watching TV, something that I, back then I didn't do much of. And I'm just like, I hear this man's footsteps running. And in my head, I was like, he, he's coming in here. I said, no, nah, no, he's not. Now this is after the CAT scans and whatever. And he ran right in my room. And the first thing out of his mouth was, do I have a surgeon? Wow. I told him, I was like, no. I said, because I'm not having surgery because I vowed <laughs> that after my youngest son was born, I said, that's it. I'm not getting cut on no more. I'm, I don't know. And so he said, no, he said, this is not elective. I said, okay, so with tomorrow morning, six o'clock, you know, I'm like bargaining with this man. He said, no, as soon as we can get a um, operating room clear. I was just like, why? He said, you, you have something funky going on in there. He said, we got to get in there. And then when I wouldn't budge, he said, listen, he said, whatever is going on in there, he said, a day or two, it'll be fatal. He said, we got to go in there. So they didn't know right away that it was cancer. No, okay. they didn't. So when the surgeon came in to see me, like they, they, they looked at my records and he said, well, you had two C-sections. He said, sometimes scar tissue will wrap around it, wrap around your intestines and it'll block it because my intestines were blocked. And he said, we'll go in, cut two inches below your navel and we'll just, you know, untie them and everything he said then you'll be going home in a day or so I'm like okay I could do this scared out of my mind mm -hmm. my family live, lives in New Jersey I'm in Connecticut so I'm I call my pastor and he prayed um called my son because my job had already called my house and he was like I can hear the fear in his what my middle son I can hear the fear so I'm putting on this brave I'm good it's going to be okay. I said, they're just going to fix it. And I'm coming home. Call my mother. I was five again. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Ma. I wouldn't call her my mommy. <laughs> I was so afraid because I just don't like to get put to sleep. I don't like how it feels. And so um, they finally get me up there to the, to the operating room and I was still kind of flying high off of morphine. So I happened to look to my left and my, my arm was strapped down. So when I went to look to the right, here comes the thing to, to put, I moved my head. I said, what are you doing? <laughs> like, and here's the surgeon with his hands up, you know, ready for his gloves. And he said, why isn't she sleep? <laughs> I said, I told all of them, I'm like, in my head, I'm pointing at them. I said, what you don't know is I'm not just scared, I'm real scared. I said, I just, you know, I don't want to do this. So, you know, the assurances and stuff, they knocked me out so quick. <laughs> mm, mm, but mm. the next morning when the surgeon came in and they um, took the bandage, he wanted to see it. And um, when they pulled it down, they pulled it from the top of my stomach all the way to the bottom. And in my mind, I'm saying, he lied. They opened me wide up. I was like, what in the world? So when he finished and they put, the, put a new bandage on, he looked me in my face and he said, when you leave here, as soon as you leave here, you have to go see an oncologist. All I said to him was, okay. He said mm -hmm. that to me for six days. I was in, I went home Christmas day, but every day he came in there, that's what he, he would say to me. So finally he said to me, he said, let me tell you what's, what's going on. He said, you have five carcinoid tumors in your intestines. Five? Five. Wow. He said, the biggest one blocked them. He said, I had to remove a foot of your intestines. In oh. order, you know, yeah, he said, and what took the surgery so long, he said, I had to check all of your, your vital organs. He said, I had to see if any, if, if it had metastasized because carcinoid tumors, most people, you only get one, you don't get several. And he, he was explaining that it's a slow growing cancer that by the time they figure out or find it it has metastasized right. so he kept saying it to me and in my mind I'm saying I watched my father go through chemo and radiation I am so not doing this and so when I got home I didn't even tell my sons about it and but I told my mom and she said oh you're going she said you're going you're going <laughs> 
I was like, because um, I had just moved back to New Jersey, but I was still working in, in, in Connecticut. So when I got out, I went home home. And my mom was like, you know, no, you're going because I was literally on my back for a, a complete two months because he took my intestines out as well. He said, if he didn't, I would have been back because scar tissue was wrapped around that. So um, I went to I went to my primary care doctor first and he was saying to me, he said, out the gate, he said, you're looking at six weeks of chemo. And I told him, I said, I don't, I don't want chemo at all. So um, man of God, he said, well, you know what? He said, we're just going to believe God for your first miracle of 2008. How about that? Right, and I said, right. yeah. I said, okay. Wow. So um, when I went to the oncologist, I was expecting them to say, so, hey, we're going to set you up for chemo, this, that, and the third. He didn't do that. He said, what we're going to do, I'm going to send you for um, what's called the octreotide scan. He said, and that's going to check your body from head to toe. And if there's cancer anywhere, it'll find it. <laughs> Excuse me. So I did. It, it took um, three days, three days. And then when he called, I think I was at a different um, doc doctor visit. <laughs> Excuse me. So my mom got the call. So when I got home, she told me there was no cancer. And I was just so grateful to God you know, that I didn't have to, you know, go through the cancer, the, the radiation chemo. or the right. chemo. And um, my pastor, I had told him the same thing. I said, I just don't, I don't, I didn't feel like I could take it, you know, because chemo was so high power and I, I just couldn't, I didn't want to do that. And um, God blessed, oh God, he blessed me that I didn't have to have chemo at all. Um, but I still had to, every three months, I had to be tested in some CAT scans. Um, I think the octreotide scan was like once a year. Um, I stayed, you know, c consistent with, with that all the time. So in 2012, it was Hurricane Sandy. And just before that, I had went to see uh, my oncologist because my, my iron count was just so low. It was a four. Right. Right. And so when he ran tests, um, the cancer was in my blood. I had to do a CAT scan and it was, they could see another tumor. So the surgeon that I went to, his name is um, Dr. Moss. He's a, he's a twin. He and his brother, they're like well-known, like on the internet, they, they served in the military and they did surgery, you know, for the um, soldiers and things like that but I didn't know it at the time. And he had said to me the same thing every doctor would say to me, this is rare. You know, this is not something that happens all the time. He said, I don't know a lot about it because I was saying to him, I was like, do you have to go in? He said, look, he said, I want you to give me two weeks. And he said, I need to consult with my colleagues. And he said, when you come back, I'm gonna tell you what I have to do. And so two weeks later, I went back and he said to me, um, he said, every doctor but one told me to go in and get it. I was, I just boohooed. Wow. I did not want to be cut again. That was the worst because in my mind, I was just going to be laid up again and not being able to take care of myself. And to me, that was the worst, not being able to do for myself at all, not being able to eat what, you know, like a normal plate of food. It was like the first one was rough recovery. And he said, the only difference is, he said, I'm not going all the way up like the first one. He said, I'm just going to go halfway. He said, but he said, every doctor I consulted told me to go in there and get it. So um, before that surgery, I went to, um, by invitation of a, a pastor in my hometown, he had invited a few of us to come to a service he was having. And I did not utter a word to anybody about how I felt. I mean, I cried when I found out because, you know, with my father, when his came back, he died. So in my mind, I thought that was going to be me. And I, I, I didn't say that. I never spoke it out of my mouth. I didn't tell anybody. But that night um, in the service, um, he said to me, he called me out. 
He said, whatever's going on in your body will not kill you. Right. I think I mopped that whole <laughs> I praise God like I lost my mind. And then I'll start saying, well, I don't need to go. I don't need to go. And, um, but I did, I went, I, I, I still went and, um, and I had the surgery and the, I think like the two days after I'm still in there, like, I think I was in the hospital that time for like six days again, five, six days, but I ended up getting a roommate who had Crohn's disease mm -hmm. and she gagged every few minutes. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Normally, I can't stand that because if you gag, I'm gagging. So it didn't bother me. It was weird. So her mom says to me, she said, if you want to change your room, she said, it's fine. We won't be offended. She said, when this happens, most people do. And I said, no, I said, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. So another day goes by and like her mom got to know me, we're talking. And so her daughter said to her this day, she said, that's it. She said, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna do this. She said, I'm just gonna, just gonna die. And her mom panicked and she said, please, please tell her, tell her she's not gonna die. And her name is Sharon. I said, Sharon, I said, you're not gonna die. Cause she was ready to give up because it was bad. And so I did, I jumped on Facebook and I just asked everybody, I said, if, you know, get a word of prayer, pray for Sharon. I said, pray for her. Um, I said, I'll tell you my, my testimony later. I said, but pray for Sharon. Yeah, pray for her that God will um, heal her and deliver her. By three o'clock that afternoon, Sharon wasn't gagging no more. Wow, that's uh, good. God is yes. good. Yes. So, so you've been diagnosed twice and you yes. fought, you, you went through it twice. Yes. and overcame cancer. Yes. So at this point, you're thinking to yourself, okay, there's got to be a better way. Tell us a little bit about some of the, yes. you start researching um, and looking yes. for more natural remedies. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. When, at first, like, because since I never did have chemo, and by the way, at the end of that surgery, they never found the tumor. Oh, <laughs> they oh, never oh, found it. They good. searched, they searched, they searched. They took off something in there analyzed it, everything there was nothing and I just believe that God positioned me and I was like God can you just send me another way but I <laughs> believe I was supposed to be there for that young lady to grab hold of faith and 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 receive the healing that God had for her I, I just really truly believe that but um after I left there um because even in conversation with with Sharon's mother um, I was telling her that I dealt with, I still do, with rheumatoid arthritis. And she was telling me which types of medication to avoid and, um, you know, try to do something different or natural. So I started researching the different medications because I had already tried a few. Right. And um, looking at side effects, because like when you read side effects that even that come from the drugstore, those are not all I found out. Right. So I started. Right. Yep. And then you have to also, even with the generic, you got to find out, well, what's the root of that? Where, you know, what's the true medication and what went into that? And did they, did they, um, when they, when the patent period was done, did they, did they recreate this medicine in the same way? Um, one of the other things that I did do was I had, um, a pharma, a pharma, some kind of DNA type test to find out, according to the medication that I was on, what best fit my body. And some of it I knew just by experience what I what I needed, and I knew that when it came to pain medication, um, for me it has to be kind of high because I have a high tolerance for pain, so it it takes a lot for me. Um, from from having um, the surgeries, I ended up with chronic GERD, which mm. um, probiotics actually help better helped than it. okay yes better than Nexium, better than anything that they've ever prescribed for me for that. Um, just a, a, a pro probiotic that 
for has proven you know to be very good for me but <coughs> excuse me for me um sometimes i don't know if it's at being over 50 or what with the 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 difficulty with um losing weight but i also found out you that know it is them, yes, you know that's, that's part of the problem yes <laughs> but then it's the for me some of the medication that that i'm that i'm that i'm on currently and i'm actually getting ready to ask my rheumatologist for a break because what it can do it could kick off other issues and like for for me my triglycerides they go up and down and it's from the medication it can mess with my glucose I, i'm not a diabetic so i'm you know gonna ask her for a break because i want stuff to come back in order and I believe that because after joining with Elisa Gabrielle with Journey to Wellness and started, I started learning like what different foods do for your body, what's best. And then recently I just looked up, you know, my blood type, what's the best food for my blood type. And what's amazing about that was it was a confirmation because um, I had stopped eating flesh of any kind for a long time. And I started craving fish and I, I'm not a seafood eater, period. Yeah, if I ate fish, it was every now and then. It wasn't like, oh, I got to have fish. But I started craving it. And I looked on this thing and that's one of the things that said I should eat is fish. It's like, oh, okay. So um, prayerfully with me pulling back and, and I've done that before like just pull back some of this medication because when I go to the doctor and they start running down the list, are you still on this? Are you still on that? And that's what made me research to see. And I was like, oh, no wonder I'm refilling this because this medication, <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness. I said, okay, so now, you know, I know what I'm dealing with. And um, just recently because of, um, the GERD and um, even I was on Linzess for um, 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 IBF, IB, whatever. IBS, that I'm very well aware yeah. of I'm taking that as well. Yeah, with, <laughs> yes. And I started taking a probiotic. It wasn't, it wasn't immediate, but over time, and then I find that if I'm more, if I walk more, that that helps as well. Um, because like one day I took, took the Linzess and I got sick to my stomach and I was just like, this is weird. I was like, I'm not taking this no more because once something makes me sick, I'm done with it <laughs> for the most <laughs> part. So my doctor, she halted two medications for me in the last month, she, the Benzest and um, Nexium, she halted it. So I was like, okay, good. And I feel better. I literally feel better like in my gut. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. So I'm glad you said that because a lot of times we'll go to the doctor and they'll say, okay, I need you to take three of these three times a day. I'll send it to your pharmacy. And we're like, okay. And then we take the medication and we don't really yes. question or we don't really um, investigate on um, what that medication does. Uh, because like right. I said, uh, the pharmacy pamphlet doesn't give you the real deal. If you go and pull up the true uh, I forget what they call it, uh, perspectives of what's in that medication and the side effects. Um, and I think the reason why they do that, and it's probably just me saying this, is because it will scare you because like you said, and I am diabetic, like you said, it'll cause, it'll, it's for this particular ailment, but while it's trying to cure this ailment, it's creating this ailment, which then you yes. have to go get another medication for. So the cycle just keeps repeating itself. So I'm glad yes. that you brought up that people should actually look to see what they're actually taking. And if they don't feel right, you know, because on Linzest, Linzest does tell you that one of the side effects is feeling nausea, uh, yes. vomiting, uh, diarrhea, and so on. And so some people might think, well, that's how I'm supposed to feel. Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and I, I, I used to, I was like, okay, it says that you might get dizzy. Okay, I'm dizzy. Okay, I still got to take this. No, I don't. No, I don't. Right. Um, I know um, which medications. And it's something how before I was treated with morphine today, if I had morphine, it cramps my stomach. 
So I don't, I don't, it's in my record. I don't do epinephrine. Epinephrine um, makes my chest hurt. And it's like, oh, mm -hmm. that's just a side effect. It's not for me, no, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, not going to do that. Um, and Bactrim, uh, um, antibiotic that I break up in hives. So I'm not going to get through the hives or either, you know, take it and deal with the hives and then fix the hives after the fact. So, you know, I think that we, we should be aware of, you know, and, it, and they always say, well, if you can't handle the side effects. Uh, well, I, and I also know that um, new medication, I can't really tolerate very well either. If it's 70 years old or more, I'm good. It, it, it's like, if it's new, it's like, no, thank you. Just so, nah. so as we close, give our listeners and our viewers some, a couple of tips on what to do when they're dealing. I mean, you've been through a lot. We all, we all know you've been through a lot. And the number one thing that got you through was God. Let's just put that yes, out there. Yes, absolutely. But God absolutely. also is an action God. Um, yes. So you have to uh, to put put action in in motion. So what are some of the things? Just a couple of things that you would advise to people on how they can take their health and take control of their health. Well, one of the first things is, is I think that um, we have to be committed to to. Um, stay in the course and not give up if you hit a, de a dead end, because sometimes information is not readily available. You have to dig, you have to research and um, pay attention to your body. And I think, you know, we're, we're so busy. We go through our day and we might get a pain, but like, oh, that's nothing. Right. But your right. body, you know, when you have a pain, your body is telling you something. If your digestion is off, there's a reason, um, and uh, like you said, doctors be like they're they're ready to give you medication, but um, I I prayerfully because I told God I have always been active my whole life and to um, get to a place to where um, I could hardly walk and I can I used to drop stuff. But I, I remember one day just a simple I had a can in my hand and it fell, and I I, I just teared up and my mom was you know she was always encouraging she was like it's okay it's okay she said I'll get it and I'm like yeah and she would do so much for me I couldn't even make my bed by myself yeah. um that's how bad the arthritis was and for for that diagnosis the thing was and I kept telling them I don't think I have fibromyalgia or whatever else they kept saying that I had um it was when I was finally diagnosed I, and I had to go to a specialist and some of these things you can't just go to anybody that has a shingle up saying that oh I'm a rheumatologist or I'm this or that you have to find a team or like um, there's a hospital that I go to they have a specialized area for that and they have doctors that deal with that so when you go there their testing procedures they're extensive. It's not like, oh, let me take some blood. It's like, oh, let me rule that out because um, it didn't show up in my blood for years. Mm -hmm. And they called that um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis with, um, with zero markers and zero is spelled S-E-R-O. And I'd never heard that. I was like, well, you know, whatever you have is in your blood, not all the time. Mm -hmm. I just, in the last three years, it's finally showed up. I, when I was tested that it was proof that I have it. In the meantime, my, my joints are deteriorating, like my hands, um, especially my thumbs, they're cooking and all this, but I'm grateful to God that um, eating better, eating healthy, and I, that's, that's the most important thing is to eat healthy, the processed stuff is no good, the fast food stuff is no good. Um, for me, it was just taking it back to what I did when I was raising my children. I came home from work and cooked every day. Right. So, you know, you didn't see the ailments back then that we do today. Um, so the vegetables, the fruit, all of that is so important. And it's made a difference. It's really, really made a difference because my labs were horrible. Mm. They were bad. And just from turn, you know, eating right, it turned it turned a whole, like I was just looking at my labs. I just had blood work yesterday, and everything's like 
no, 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 no. I don't get to see that. The only thing that um, gets thrown off, like it's, it's either from the medication or like my white blood count is usually high because my body is in constant fight because of the rheumatoid arthritis because it's, right. it's um, autoimmune. So my body fights against itself. And so the, the, every now and then I might get a normal count, but most of the time I don't. So, um, and the, the goal for that is to push it into remission. So I'm still working on that, still doing my best to, to work on that. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad we had this conversation and this conversation, excuse me, <laughs> this conversation can go on forever, but we do have to come to an end. And I do want to have you back um, because you've, you've given some very valuable information that others are also going through out there. But before we close out, can you tell uh, our readers how they can reach you? And if you want to go ahead and plug your book or any of your events or anything, go ahead and do that now. <laughs> okay. Um, you can reach me on Facebook, Facebook, Cheryl Gordon Love. Um, same thing on Instagram. Uh, same thing on YouTube. Twitter, um, LinkedIn, same thing, Cheryl Gordon, Cheryl Gordon Love. Um, email is CherylBooks at Yahoo.com. And the book that would coincide with this, with um, our conversation is um, Limitless Through My Limitedness, a personal testimony. I literally, I, would, I had given up trying to even work in ministry anymore like my sons god has blessed them to um be active in ministry so in my mind i said i'm just going to support them but i was standing at the altar one sunday one sunday morning and god said to me spoke to me audibly you're limitless through your limitedness and that was just so powerful to me because he just lets me know regardless of my limitedness and we all have limits but god has a way of using us in spite of all of that and so i was encouraged to write that book and to share my journey that yes. is so true and i want to thank you for being on the show like i said i enjoyed our conversation I want to hear more, so I want to have you back on the show, but um, I wish you all the best. May God bless you. May God heal you, and um, I really want to hear your progress, but thank you for being on the show, mm -hmm. Sorrell. Thank you so much for having me, and God bless you, too. God bless you, too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah,